for the HSAN in run-up to the annual conference. Welcome, I'm Ben. Nick here at the University of Sydney, a lecturer in International Comparative Literature and Translation Studies, and with me is Rodney. Rodney, we want to say a quick word about yourself. Yeah, hi, I'm a, a lecturer in American Studies at the US Study Center at the uh, University of Sydney. I'm very happy to be co-organizing the AHSN annual conference uh, this year, which this is a kind of pre-event for it with the event proper uh, beginning uh, next week. Right. Um, we do not have her quite here yet, which is um, to say Jessica Mina Davies from the HSAN, the coordinator of the network. So she's coming in maybe in a bit and is going to say a couple of words on the organization, uh, on the organization's behalf, what the organization is about. In any case, we have a couple of people from the HSA in here, like Bruce, I can see he's online. Hi, Bruce. Welcome. Um, so we've got the most amazing guest with us today, Rachel Ormiller. Um, I'm going to throw it over to Rachel in a moment. Let me just give you the reedy bits before she's just doing the talky bits and say a couple of words on who she is and what she's talking to you about today. Of course, you can say that on your own later, but just to give you a bit of a framing idea of what today's webinar is really all about. So Rachel, and again, this is pardon for the really bit here, just a quick summary of who this amazing speaker is that we have here today. Rachel Ormila is a lecturer in the discipline of English and comparative literature at the Institute for Study of Sexuality and Gender at Columbia University, New York. Rachel is interested in the ethical and political dimensions of emotion, sensations, and desire. And it so happens she's writing about that quite extensively, and we're happy to have her talk to us about one of those aspects here today. In previous work, she specifically analyzes touch as the site of disorientation and crisis. I looked into that book, and I think it's fantastic. We cannot talk about it all today, but Rachel is talking about another aspect of sensations and emotions, which is called the laughing matter of spirit, a forthcoming work that's coming, Rachel, when? This year, next year, you might be able to talk to us a bit about that. Uh, in her work, the laughing matter of spirit, she questions what changes when nothing changes. There we go. That's a good start. <laughs> the book looks backwards in defeat with Hegel and Marx at the repeated failure of revolution. Who doesn't appreciate a failed revolution? It also looks upon the grotesque in comic horror with Benjamin and the Yugoslavian partisan resistance. So that was a muscle there. And finally, the laughing matter of spirit, it locates a kind of political action that can only begin to take place from a position of absolute defeat. Today, Dr. Ormiller kindly agreed to be with us to talk about her forthcoming work, and we kindly welcome her to the HSAN third annual webinar and thank her for her time. Rachel, over to you, please. Thank you so much, Ben and Rodney. I'm really happy to be here today and for everybody who is here with us today. I, it's just really an honor to share this project with you. I just submitted the full manuscript and it's under contract right now with Northwestern. So it feels very fresh and I'm really looking forward to this conversation and to making new friends and laughter. So share my screen with you. This book, The Laughing Matter of Spirit, it's about Hegel's philosophy of ancient comedy and the influence this has on Marx's idea of revolution. So I show how Marx and his friends called the Young Hegelians are reading Hegel's aesthetics of comedy as they're thinking about the idea of um, revolution as a kind of historical comedy. It's a stage of history that looks at its own contradictions and it can't, it can't take itself seriously anymore. So it erupts in a kind of um, a laughter, social rebellion. But my project begins a little bit earlier, not with Hegel's aesthetics or his philosophy of comedy, but with his book. It's a formal book of logic called The Science of Logic. So there's, it's, there seems to be nothing very funny about this book. It's a very fat and very dense book of formal logic. But I actually read his logic as a kind of satire. So a lot of Western thinking is based in Aristotle's logic, which is based on the idea of non-contradiction. It's the law of non-contradiction, which means A equals A. I am equivalent to myself. But Hegel's science of logic begins with the contradiction. And he forms it as a relationship between being and nothing. These two things that seem like opposites, he shows that they actually mirror each other. And he wants to say that there's a contradiction in 
in being itself, in thinking itself, and even within the subject ourselves, that we're not exactly equivalent with ourselves. So I'm rereading the science of logic as a kind of satire. So today I'm going to be thinking about the idea of duos or comic duos in the form of the odd couple or twins. And I'm gonna think about how um, the redoubling of the double, this is a trope that we see in comedy, for example, like in Shakespeare, he'll have a set of twins and then he'll have a second set of twins. And he plays with the kind of comedy of having two sets of doubles. And I read the science of logic as playing with the same formula. And I kind of explore why are two sets of two funnier or why do they increase attention that's already present in an original double? So I'm just gonna read to you a little bit of this book. There we go. So it's based on this idea. Usually we think of dialectics as uh, happening in three sets. For example, uh, if you know anything about Hegel, maybe you were taught that Hegel, un his dialectic unfolds in sets of three. So maybe you've heard this term, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. I don't read Hegel this way. Instead, I read him as thinking in sets of doubles and the redoubling of the double. Because Hegel says that you can read dialectic in sets of three, but you can also read it in sets of four. So what changes when we count a little bit differently? I'm gonna begin this talk today about thinking about an uh, old commercial series uh, by Double Mint Gum. Double Mint Gum is this old, yeah, this old gum. So let's consider the old Double Mint Gum commercials and their unforgettable imperative, double your pleasure, double your fun. The first commercial for Double Mint Chewing Gum aired in 1960. A woman sits in front of her vanity, intently gazing at her own reflection as she combs her hair. As she stands up and turns away from the vanity, her reflection follows her. And to her delight, her reflection is revealed to belong to another figure with her exact appearance and form. Wrigley's double mint gum twins are born in this moment when the lonely girl finds her perfect companion in her reflection that comes to life. In a delightful moment, one is revealed to be two. One will never be alone again now that she is two. When the 80s rolled around, Wrigley decided that it's, uh, the twins weren't as funny anymore. The fantasy of the twins at first had sex appeal. But at the end of the day, there was something kind of sad about the autoerotic nature of a girl who had only her reflection for a companionship. Rather than imagining herself, or rather than imagining oneself erotically positioned between two playful sisters, the viewer instead sees herself in the image of the girl blowing bubbles alone in front of her mirror. While one is shown to be two, two is also still one. The original loneliness of the one is only redoubled in two. It's only magnified by the mere reflection. But just as Minty Fresh was losing its flavor, Wrigley found their marketing solution within their own tagline, come on, double it. See if I can move on from this slide. Here we go. Uh, I wanna, if I can do this, I think I'm gonna switch over to YouTube because I would like you to hear this really great jingle because I think the jingle is incredible and very memorable if you grew up during this time period. A double pleasure is waiting for you. A double pleasure from double mid A double great feeling making you realize double is the one for you. Double fresh, double smooth. Double delicious to chew. Double pleasure is way show you. 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 Double pleasure is In the 
early commercials, a silhouette of identical men appear in the background or the foreground in the position that the audience occupies. The new campaign brought the boys to the same playing field as the girls, making all four figures objects of pleasure. The girls were redoubled in their male counterparts, finding lovers at last in the redoubling of the first autoerotic double. Wrigley's campaign found success in the classic comic trope of the double-double, used frequently in ancient comedy through Shakespeare. The two sets of twins for, in the comedy of errors, for example, allow for double the pleasure by doubling the trouble with more possibilities for confusion, misidentifications, inversions, and the old switcheroo. But why does the first double become more fun or even funnier in its redoubling? What does the doubling of the double reveal about the first double? And I argue that the dialectical redoubling of the double reveals something that was already true about the relationship of the first duo. Something, or, or more precisely nothing new, emerges in the relationship between the split between the first double and the reproduction of the split in the second double. One is the subject of tragedy, as Artaud argues. The content of tragedy is that which is absolutely singular, that which cannot be repeated or represented by another. Hegel also identifies tragedy by oneness. But for him, the oneness of tragedy is a joke for comedy. Comedy is the process of Comedy is the process of, is this okay? Actually, the, um, okay, cool. Sorry to interrupt, but if I keep it, the um, PowerPoint expanded, can you still see me too? We can't see the PowerPoint. Um, I, we can't see the PowerPoint, yeah. When the PowerPoint That's is jealous. playing, um, can you still see my face as well? Yes. Okay, well. great. I just wanted to make sure because there's long um, spells of not yeah. the PowerPoint. I mean, we, we can't see the uh, we can't see the PowerPoint right now. So if you want to share that yeah. again, Rachel. Okay. okay, great. I will pause this. So the tragic figure sees herself from the start as an absolute singularity. Her conviction to her ethical ideals pits her against the world. She's tragic, however, not because she must die at the hands of a world that refuses to see her rightness. Her tragedy is instead in her one-sidedness, her inability to see that her deeply personal convictions are also the product of the system that she believes she opposes. On the other side of the tragic hero is the one who protests the unity of the whole and demands the challenger's death. This one, that who opposes the first one fails to see that the transgressive action of the outsider is also demanded by the ethical system that he protects. What appears to be the loneliest number is a logical absurdity. There are always two tragic heroes who mirror each other in their opposition. Tragedy can only see itself in the eyes of one of the heroes on one of the sides of the conflict. And it tries to maintain the absurdity of its ultimate oneness by killing the one who embodies the conflict. The conflict, however, doesn't belong to the challenger or the outsider, who actually really isn't an outsider at all, but it belongs to the stage itself, to society, to the drama. Tragedy cannot see that the crack that divides one and the second one is that which constitutes the stage. Tragic blindness is blindness to the perspective of the blind spot itself the non-perspective of the crack. The tragic perspective does not see that the figure of the double is always lurking within one. Conservative comedy, or what Marx calls farce, is also tragically blind to the crack within one. It attempts to relieve the tragic alienation by providing one with a companion. And so one becomes either one becomes two either through a twin or through the company of her missing half, an opposite who makes her whole and concrete. The trope of the odd couple is as classic as the trope of the twins. 
Unlike the twins, there seems to be something inescapably funny about the difference between the fusion of two opposites. The first figure of the odd couple unto himself is indistinguishable from the tragic hero. The first is typically narrow-minded and stubborn, hot-headed and quick to anger. He shakes his fist at the world, which he must conquer with his small-minded plans. He's blinded to his own one-sidedness. And unto himself, this, frustra this frustrated, isolated figure is not very funny at all. And yet when the spirit of gravity is paired with its opposite, the spirit of frivolity, the tragic nature of the first seems to be diffused. Figure one represents order, necessity, fate, and essence, both what is and what ought to be. Figure two, in contrast, represents play, possibility, contingency, and accident, both what may be and what is not. One is absolute and one is negative. At each step, the second figure trips up the fatalism of the first. At each turn, the seriousness and severity of the first is mocked by the silliness of the second. The tragedy of the first is constantly overturned through his comic shadow, who is an immediate repetition of his every movement. Like the broom-faced sweeper dog from Alice in Wonderland, the comic double immediately sweeps away the tracks of tragedy. But is the tragic nature of the first one really overcome by the comic cleanup man? Hegel saw Greek comedy on the ancient stage, not as comic relief from tragedy, but as a mirror of the tragic stage. As he puts it, the reconciliation on the comic stage of, his, of Greek history is only superficial or partial freedom. On the tragic stage, the great hero steps before the chorus to defend the absolute rightness of her actions. She soberly utters, it is, it must be, it cannot be undone. The tragic hero solemnly sacrifices herself in the name of her gods who she represents. On the comic stage, however, the gods are brought out on stage and made to represent themselves. We laugh as they are tortured and mocked. When we cry out, the gods are dead. All that was is not, it is not. The double in the form of the odd couple represents these two stages on one stage. The tragic utterance, it is, is met by the comic proclamation, it is not. Now in the 90s, we kids played an incredibly obnoxious game in which one person would interrupt someone else's speech and scream not. So you might say, oh, Rachel, I really like your talk. Not That's how it originated. And, um, I think it comes from Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. And actually in 1992, not was declared the word of the year. But we took this to a new extreme where one person would begin to speak and we would just say not in their face, almost before the words would come out of their mouth, we would yell not. And I actually had this t-shirt with the troll on it. My sister had a t-shirt with the with a green colored haired, green haired troll and her said radical. And I had this pink t-shirt that said not. So the comic double, double operates uh, on this game of not. One says it is and two responds not, it is not. The immediate movement from the tragic one to the comic double is the first movement of Hegel's science of logic. We begin with being, but the moment we try to point to being, to determine what it is that being might be, we arrive at its negative double, nothing. A radical change appears in the transition from being to nothing, from the spirit of gravity to the spirit of frivolity from the it is to the it is not, from tragic seriousness to comic laughter. However, insofar as these two stages appear as simply opposed, even as they appear on the same stage, the relationship between one and not one fails to show us anything new. The radical change in form is a mere repetition of the same old content. Insofar as the two appear to be simply opposed, we miss the biggest joke of philosophy. 
according to logic, being and nothing cannot be the same. And yet we cannot distinguish one from the other. The odd couple turns out to be similar to the twins in that in both cases, the second term fails to show us newness. We see this in the opening lines of Hegel's Science of Logic, which, we, which may be read dialectically through both the figures of the twins and of the odd couple. So being is already its own twin. Being pure being, these are the opening lines of Hegel's Science of Logic. Being pure being is mirrored in nothing, pure nothingness. Because when we try to think of just the abstract concept of being, if you close your eyes and try to imagine it, it looks a lot like nothingness. And then if you close your eyes and try to imagine nothingness, it looks a lot like pure being because there's no content to them. So as a logical abstraction, they're indistinguishable, even though they should be opposites. So Hegel starts off being comma, pure being. Being is split by a comma and repeated from the beginning, but it's also mirrored in its repetition, nothing comma, pure nothingness. Because being is always already split, it is immediately self-relating. You can imagine the autoerotic frustration of being when it tries to touch itself and grasps at nothing. Nothing appears to be a negation of being, but it is instead the reproduction of the empty contents of being, the comma, the split, the split, the crack. In fact, the only content of being in nothing is the stutter itself, a negative glitch in negativity. Within the paradox of a crack within pure nothingness, we find an expression of, neg of the negation of the negation which is not an affirmation, but rather a stirring of indeterminate negativity within determinate negation. When the stutter in the empty content of pure being is repeated in the stutter within pure nothingness, negativity itself both is both deepened and heightened. I know this is a this part of the talk is like very, very dense, and I go into a lot of detail about this formal logic and the double of the double within this within this logical system. But today I'll try to animate this very dense and abstract idea of the dialectical redoubling of being and nothing through the characters of Laurel and Hardy. And Laurel and Hardy are really one of my favorite uh, comic duos. Uh, I'm missing slides here. Oliver Hardy played the role of the serious man who was very easily frustrated. Stan Laurel, Hardy's easygoing sidekick, played the role of the simpleton. While Ollie easily loses his temper, Stan bursts into tears. And yet Stan, who seems so fragile and naive, always seems to come up on top without even trying. His mere presence causes Ollie to self-sabotage. In every episode, Ollie, thinking he knows best, forcefully pushes Stan out of the way and takes the lead. Ollie, of course, walks directly into the disaster while Stan remains unscathed. The chemistry between Laurel and Hardy reflects the dynamics between the spirit of gravity and the spirit of frivility. However, there are two Laurel and Hardy shorts that intensify the formula of the odd couple times two. One of their shorts is called times two, and it's actually a short where they the first short where they redouble themselves by playing their wives. So they were one of the first, or I think they were actually the first, um, yeah, actors and directors to use this trick where they would overlay two films on top of each other so that they had, they could play themselves and their wives and be in the same shot. That's so that, that one was called twice too. But I'm not gonna talk about that one. I'm gonna talk about the second time they did this uh, in a short called The Brats. And in this one, they used a further trick where they shrunk the film. So they played themselves. This is a. They played themselves and they played their sons. And so they they were uh, just their grown up men just shrunk a little bit to be their to be their mini me's. 
So this early episode is special because it's one of the only films that features the comic duo without any other actors. It's just the two of them, but actually there's four characters. But the double isn't alone on stage because Dan Senior, or Stan Senior and Ollie Senior are redoubled in their roles as Stan Junior and Ollie Junior. The scene opens with a game of checkers. Ollie is determined to win, although Stan has already captured a large stock, a large stack of Ollie's red checker pieces. Like a game of not, in which children negate each other words almost before they leave the other's mouth. Stan jumps to make a move, the moment Ollie's hand hovers over a checker piece. When Stan is distracted, Ollie makes quickly makes his play. Stan immediately captures two more pieces. It is, it is not, it is not. The spirit of gravity plays the spirit of frivility at a game of checkers. In this, this dark scene has a, um, I mean, this scene has a dark double in Bergman's The Seventh Seal in which Antonius faces death in a game of chess. But Stan and Ollie don't play chess, but rather a round of children's checkers, which Ollie nevertheless treats very seriously. The checkers game is redoubled in the children's game where the boys go back and forth. First they play blocks where one puts down a block, then the second puts down a block, then the other puts down a block, and eventually Ollie's hands gets like smashed. And this game is repeated in two more games. So they have four games that go back and forth that inev inevitably end in a crash. Uh, they finally play a game of of um, of it. And the thing about a game of it, if you were to play it, it's a game of tag your it, and it's shortened for, instead of saying tag your it, it's just shortened as it. And the first thing you do when you say tag your it is say not it, not it. So a game of it always immediately becomes a game of not it. Between one and two, there's a change in form, but not content. Since it and not are initially are initially indistinguishable. In the second movement of repetition, the redoubling, there's no formal change between one and two, or between Laurel and Hardy, and three and four, the reproduction of Laurel and Hardy in their mini -mies. So what changes in the repetition between the first double in their exact duplication, which, which can produce like an excess of pleasure or of humor? And my answer is nothing. Nothing changes in the dialectical redoubling of the comic double, but nothing changes in three ways. First, nothing changes on the level of form. There's an exact reduplication of being and nothing, being and nothing, uh, or Laurel and Hardy, Laurel and Hardy. Uh, secondly, there's a new expression of negativity. When the split between the first duo is itself repeated in the second, uh, the split itself is repeated in the second. Negativity itself is augmented and undergoes transformation. So between the first two odd couple, for example, there's a tension or a kind of split that connects them. And this is reproduced in the second. And the tension between the first two is magnified in the tension in the second two. But third, nothing itself reveals itself to be the agent of its own transformation. So nothing is the one, or negativity is the thing that is doing or producing the change. The crack between being and nothing is in the position of the subject who in counting dialectically to three forgets to count herself. Or to be more exact, she forgets to count herself as nothing. She forgets to grasp herself by her own crack. So the crack that seems to be, or the tension that seems be, to be between one and two is within each figure already. The oscillation between Stan Jr. and Ollie Jr. highlights what should have already been obvious in the chemistry between Laurel and Hardy. The second does not make the first whole, or the second doesn't overcome the first as the work of the negative, which only takes off in the redoubling. Instead, the two opposites are somehow always already wrapped up in each other because both are constituted by a crack that binds and separates them. There's no Laurel without Hardy, 
no Hardy without Laurel. The tension between the two sustains both sides. And it's precisely because each is bound to his distinct role that the severity and seriousness of the one has already crossed over into the lightness of the other. On the other hand, the frivility of the second is already bound by the gravity, the gravity of the first, where the second finds his lightness. As Manon Delar writes, perhaps this is what comedy does. It sees double in what ought to be clearly separated. And precisely by seeing them as a couple, as the double of each other, as twins, it produces the comic effect. There is an object X that emerges between the two. Now, what may already be obvious to us must become obvious to the double itself. As Stan says in one of his most famous nonsensical proverbs, you can lead a horse to, to water, but a pencil is made out of lead. Ollie, the spirit of gravity, must get hit on the head with a block by the second set of doubles to realize that Stan's accidental insight when he confuses himself with Ollie in their mini knees. So Stan scolds the boys. If you don't be quiet, we'll have to send us to bed. To which Ollie replies, not we, them. But Stan's misspoken words are always closer to the truth. The brilliance of the brat sketch is that between the double and the redoubling, nothing changes. And for this very reason, the humor is heightened twice too. Comedy is not in the second repetition, but in the crack that makes being in nothing a game of it, not it. The laughing matter of spirit emerges when nothing itself changes. When the crack is split open by yet another crack, in the doubling of the double, the transformation of negativity itself. Thank you all for letting me share that. Yeah. And... Wonderful. Thanks so much for that uh, tremendous presentation, uh, Rachel. There's a lot for us there to uh, to chew on and to, to think about. And while we are doing that, you know, sort of processing what we've heard, I wonder if you could say a little bit about uh, the writing process of this book, like how you came about to embarking on this project, just before we get into, you know, some, some more specifics. Uh, that's challenging because I actually began this work such a long time ago and it began as a, as yeah, it's fun to, for you to jog my memory, but uh, I was reading Marx and the Young Hegelian's political writings and I was just surprised at how many references there are to comedy and humor within these writings about revolution. It's not something that was ever, I had, yeah, I ever noticed before. And I think about actually Marx himself as a, a kind of serious thinker, at least at that point I did, I was like really familiar with his economics. And uh, so, so I was really curious about that. And that led me to go back to Hegel and to think about his idea of comedy. I was wondering yeah, how that influenced the, the political thinking of people like Marx and Ruga and uh, Stirner. Um, Rachel, if I may, so just as a question to take along from there, um, as you know, you know, we were talking or you were talking about the comedic aspect of the one and the double and how that, you know, is basically set in perpetuity when you have Laurel and Hardy. So what happens when you double the doubling act? I was wondering if you could talk maybe a bit more about where do you see the comedy? I mean, obviously, you know, you've lined that out, but can you maybe talk a bit more about Whereas, you know, your, your idea of the laughing spirit in all of that and, um, you know, this wonderful idea of sending yourself to bed, you know, where, where Lauren Hardy, where you were talking about the twins. So you have two, I'm being a twin myself, you know, I find it hilarious. That he, Are you? Know, you? <laughs> um, yeah, and it was a bit tragic as well. So I'm growing up because, you know, there is a sense of like identity, you know, it, it kind of reverberates that when you talked about it. But can you talk a bit more about this idea of, you know, the crack, the tragicness of being one and, nothingness being doubled into like twice the nothingness, not like twice, you know, the fairness. So it, maybe just to untie a couple of these concepts we were talking about, maybe just so we have an idea of where you're locating all of that. Sure, like, I mean, we could begin with tragedy and I always go back to Antigone, who's like one of our favorite all time tragic heroes, I think. We have a figure like, or like Antigone, 
who's posed up against Kriya. And so Antigone is herself split between two roles that are incompatible, her role as sister and her role as citizen that demand contrary actions. And we often think of like the tension is between her and this ethical system or between her and Creon who represents that. But Creon is also torn between two roles, between his role as king and sovereign in his personal role to her. And, um, and so each character you can see they're already a double in themselves, but it, this is precisely what the tragic hero can't see. And it's because they wanna to cling to themselves and insist on themselves as a unity and as a rightness that they won't see that what constitute them is itself a contradiction, that each of them are a living contradiction. So they seem like the odd couple who are opposed in what they want from the world and what they want from each other. And it seems like if only one of them could die, or like if, if Antigone who represents the disorder or the conflict, if she could be put to death or eliminated, then the whole system could return to its unity. But of course that unity doesn't exist. And the fact that they're both already a living contradiction is a product of that. And I think there's a way that comedy can bring that contradiction to the surface, whether it's a formal comic uh, cinema that plays with this, where we see very explicitly that, that tension between one and one, that they're already a double themselves. It's already implied with two characters on stage but then when you redouble each side, that, that idea that one, one is already two and the second is already two, that there's actually a, a tetrad lurking within this duo uh, comes to the surface and it can't be ignored. So it plays it out so that nobody, the stage itself can't ignore this, this obvious contradiction and tension. And I think that comedy actually happens the moment that the stage feels the tension and it refused to conceal it. And that's why I have a concept of a historical comedy. It's a uh, historical stage that really can't bear to conceal its own tensions anymore. And I think, and that just before I throw it back to Rodney and, and you know, he brought a couple of questions that, you know, to the audience you can say we prepared them ahead of time and, and had a pre-interview with Rachel about these amazing things that she sent us in preparation for today. So I was wondering, as you, you know, as you're saying, the, com the comedic makes the tragic more apparent. So, you know, it's just, I guess, it makes it inevitable to refuse to acknowledge that, you know, there is this inherent tragic, like, twinness to all of us. Uh, you know, it's, it's inherently there, and it's also artificially there. Um, so when you were writing this book, how much did this idea of the comedic twin, you know, factor into all of it. Did you watch a lot of Lauren and Hardy to prepare on that? Or a lot of really, you know, top of in gun? You know, I think, you know, the commercial aspect of the twin motive and the twin characters, all the major comedies, you know, um, Parent Trap, you know, that's what Lindsay Lohan built her career on in popular culture with the twinning effect, for God's sake, you know. And then yeah. you've got the sexuality of the twin and it's in all major porn industries, it's about the twin effect. So the comedic doubling of our desire being projected back onto us. So can you maybe talk, a, because you do a lot on pop culture, which is also yeah. my area, so can you maybe talk a bit of that? Yeah, we see this trope of both the twins and the odd couple in different genres. So it's not just comedy, but um, also I write a little bit about the trope of the twins, for example, in horror, like The Shining, we have those twins in the hallway and uh, famous twins. And there's uh, this other 90, I like these, this book has a lot of 90s reference, which is, pretty fun for me, but <laughs> uh, it's fun to have like Hegel's Science of Logic in 90s together, see what the 90s bring out of Hegel, <laughs> tease out of Hegel. Uh, but there's this, this cult classic called Single White Female where this woman, this young, young woman has a new roommate who ends up, and at first they seem like the odd couple, they're like really different. The first girl is so outgoing and beautiful and the second is very timid and kind of mousy and eventually the the second one takes over the first identity so she haunts the other and really at the end tries to kill her and you have this this battle in the basement where it's a fight to the death there's not room enough for the two of them for two of the same i'm wondering like what makes something what makes the trope of the twins a subject for horror and what makes it a subject of comedy and I and, turned and, to and, and, yeah. yeah. And and sorry, and you know, as we we're saying, you know, the competition for being the one, the trying, you know, being the yeah, original the one. 
if you go like on Halloween, you know, people dressing up as I don't know, Kim Kardashian, you know, and it's like, but what if you had the original and the copy of the twin in the same room, you know, when they have got a competition for being the original or you know, Hollywood is faking all of these things that we you know, filming in real life. So it's got a competition for being the one. And we've got a whole industry of doubling or twinning with us, a multi-billion dollar industry of twinning the reality that we live in. And it makes us get into and live into that reality of the twin. And it makes us forget the original, you know, the other twins. So isn't that grotesquely, horrendously, you know, faking the reality we live in? I mean, you just, your work kind of brought all of this up for me. But I'm going to shut up and throw it over to Rodney, who's got another question for you. And then we might just take it slowly to the audience for their questions. Yeah, That's I mean... Really Mm -hmm. So this put me in mind about of the uh, discourse around the deep fake now, which is kind of a version of this twinning that you are teasing out across this kind of deep philosophical enterprise, right? That in some ways there's a kind of deep fakery going on here um, between the twins. And I wonder, so the, the odd couple brings kind of starkly to bear this kind of tetradic structure that you're bringing out between being and nothingness. And you know, I think it's John Lyman who wrote about the odd couple in this book uh, called Stand Up in Theory, Abjection in America, I think is the name of the book, it's from 2000. And he talks about the odd couple where um, the straight man has a name and the other figure doesn't really have a name, like sometimes called the comedian, and he wants to read it in terms of queerness, but I think you could also read it in terms of beer and being and, and, and nothingness. But I wonder what happens with doubles when they aren't sort of immediately apparent. So if you have, say, a serial figure emerging across a series of films such as Chaplin, right, and then if you talked about this um, and it, the, the chapters that you sent to Ben and I, Mark somewhere remarks that history repeats itself versus tragedy than is farce, but what he failed to mention was that tragedy and farce repeats itself versus tragedy than as farce. I think we have that movement in Chaplin's career uh, when he ends up basically becoming Hitler. Right, yeah. that there is this, you know, this sort of grotesque doubling, which he himself thought was grotesque afterwards. He said, "If I actually knew that I became the one in that when I became Hinkle, I would not have, have made the film." So, if there's one, wondering if there's something about twinning, sort of across time or, or at a distance, as opposed to sort of being directly in front of us. Wow, that's. That's really fascinating. Yeah. I also, I also found that like in writing, there's kind of feels like there's this progression, like first tragedy, like Mark says, then comedy, almost as if comedy really brings resolution or Marx talks about this happy separation with the past. But I think that's exactly what Hegel saw as that kind of comedy that thinks that it's left the tragedy of the past in the past. There's something about that that turns into kind of a horror. If you think that by mocking something or by doubling it, we've somehow have like, um, mitigated the the horror of say somebody like Hitler. It uh, it's like that um, that there's something kind of like eerie about that, or or even horrifying. And I found that like a lot of my writing on comedy, like horror, would come up. So it wasn't really about tragedy and comedy; it would turn into about comedy and horror. And I think what Hegel was worried about with ancient comedy is that when we see it as a resolution for tragedy, as something separate it actually reproduces tragedy and actually turns into something like horror because it's not really um, acknowledging tragedy and the suffering of tragedy. So that's why I think the odd couple, when you think about these two, one representing tragedy and one representing comedy, like in order for comedy to be liberating, it has to really hold within itself the suffering of tragedy too. I would say that probably somebody like Chaplin does that in his comedy too beautifully, but I can see how how that could be troubling too. Yeah, and not um, taking account of that history, uh, you know, Ben talked about in Halloween dressing up as the Kardashians. Well, for a long time, people would wear like Nazi uniforms as well, which yeah. has become, you know, prohibited, right? You kind of can't do that because of precisely what you're talking about, I think, not sort of capturing the, the tragedy or sort of overlooking it or not giving it its, its due. Yeah, there can be a way that laughter might make us feel free from the conditions that produce that laughter. If we're laughing at something, it somehow doesn't touch us anymore. But I think there's another kind of deeper comedy that comes with this moment of, of horror or of sadness where you realize that the contradiction really belongs to us. And it, that's a different kind of laughter that erupts out of 
how we grasp ourselves by the contradiction that we are rather than some somebody who's has gained distance from it through our laughter or comedy. And so just to bring this to a close for Rodney and my questions and then throw to the audience and I can see that Jessica posted a question in the chat and she's here with us and can then maybe just ask her that um, personally. So I think that, you know, what Rodney and I were talking to you about again in the, in the lead up to the event was when Hegel, you know, is pointing out that, and he think, I think he says that in the, the science of logic, where, you know, the fear that causes, you know, or hits you and causes the wound is also the same thing that closes it later out. So it's, you know, the thing that damages and, and violates is also the thing that heals you. And this has been picked up over and over. Like Günther Anders, you know, another philosopher that, you know, wrote extensively about the idea of the original and how technology is, you know, doubling that. And um, these things, you know, that are being doubled, they come back to haunt us. Just, you know, think about, again, as you were pointing out, you know, television or film, you know, all these big copy industries or the twinning, twinning industries there, they're coming back to haunt us and we do not know quite how to deal with that horror, the uncanniness of that thing. You know, all these selfies that we're taking when we are endlessly twinning ourselves and this is coming back, it's funny and comedic in the first run, but then, you know, it becomes the horrendous thing if it's going, if it's going to haunt you and you're being confronted with a selfie 10 years later, you know, an actress that is aging and cannot escape from that forever young twin. So mm -hmm. um, I was just going to ask you about, so where do you see, because you know, you're saying what, what is happening when you, you know, you're, you oppose Hegel with the 90s, and I thought that was a brilliantly put reference there on how your book works. Um, and Jessica has also known she had the question about Bert Storm, so I guess it goes in, along those lines in um, the artifice or the artificiality of, of the twinning process. Um, do you think that gives it the, you know, the comedicness? Because we can, you know, we, we can see how technical the process is, and we're we're turning into these technically reproduced creatures. So is it a commentary on the technicality of us, the training process, just how, how artificial it is that you're talking about there? Uh, wow, that's such a rich comment. Wow. Uh, oh, okay. No, it's really nice. It's really um, opened up so many thoughts for me. First, I think, why is the, the, uh, the repetition of us say in our social media presence for some of us that becomes a little bit uncanny and maybe it's because deep down we really still want to be the original and when you realize that oh my social media presence is taking over that feels like that's more real than me or something like that maybe some people feel that way if they have a very active online persona or something like that and it's that i think it reveals to us that we're still we're so, we're not so much like postmodernists that we don't care about things like authenticity or unity and I think what's what's beautiful about modernism and Hegel's thought is that he thinks that unity is impossible, but we still long for it. So it's always that longing to be the one, to be the original, to, for me to be myself, and that clinging to it. And then that frustration of having my identity disrupted by another version of me or somebody else who's threatening to overshadow me. And it turns out that from the beginning, that was always true of my subjectivity. There's always somebody else shadowing me or threatening to take over my existence. And that's that's me, that's a kind of negativity that belongs to me, the aspect of me that I can't even grasp. So that artificial or technological level shows a, a more originary split that's within us. Perfect, I mean, yeah, thanks so much for that. Um, and with that, if that's okay, Rodney, we might just um, open the floor for questions from the audience. We have about 30 something minutes left and then give Jessica a couple more minutes at the end to say a bit about the agency, and if that's okay. Um, Jessica, would you like to unmute and ask your question to Rachel or I can read it out, whichever way you prefer. Well, I think you've just asked my question for me then and, and Rachel has given a wonderful answer. Sincere apologies. Uh, Sushi, who is also present, and I were trapped in a parallel universe. It wasn't funny, but it was funny. But it was also <laughs> horrifying because there wasn't any Rachel. Uh, I don't know if you know Rachel. Oh, no. There were two rooms open, and we were in the other room where oh, only no. Shadow was present. <laughs> so we were also in the other <laughs> Then we switched rooms. <laughs> It was, quite, it was quite bizarre, but we are both now here. Hi, Sushi. <laughs> Glad you made it too. And thank you, Rodney, for facilitating our transfer. 
he realized what was going on. Uh, I uh, this question about artificiality and drawing attention to the repetition, the doubling, uh, the patterning, all the things that Bergson pointed to. I find him a very much underrated philosopher of the comic, and I wondered what your feeling was. Do you find anything useful in his approach? Hmm. One of the reasons I. I'm, I'm sure I would, especially like the richness of his philosophy of time and thinking about comedy through that. And I would like to turn to him. I think like one reason I, this book brings together a lot of figures that you wouldn't associate with comedy. And I think of them as philosophers of comedy. So I leave aside, like Nietzsche is not really present there or Kierkegaard or other people who write about like the relationship between suffering and laughter who are actually like someone like Kierkegaard who was actually in Berlin at the same time as the young Hegelians and they were attending the same comedy during this time. So, uh, but one thing I really do in this, in this book is find very serious, people who we think of as very serious philosophers like Hegel and Marx or even Benjamin, who's like we think of as the melancholic and bring them in and show that they're philosophers of comedy. So I wish I could, I wish I had more to talk about with Bergson, but it's been such a, a while since I've worked with him, but actually I would love to hear how you would bring him into this conversation. Um, yeah, I, th I think on comedy, like like his approach to physics and so forth, uh, he's been discarded for a very long time. Um, but actually he was very far-sighted and I think he's of the modern time. Uh, he won his Nobel Prize, you know, for literature, but not for philosophy. Um, and, and he was frowned on by socialist writers like George Bernard Shaw, who you know, thought he was a, a hoax. But I read him as a philosopher of the comic as liberation, of a way of reconciling exactly what you're talking about. I, you, I desire to be unique, but the fact that we're trapped in this nature, horrendous thing called existence, nature, uh, and, and can't escape from it. Uh, and how to how to supervene by laughing at it. And I think that's very relevant to humor as resistance these days. Um, so maybe you'll write the book that I've been waiting for on Bergson. That would be good, Reg. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a companion that I should turn to next. Do we have any other questions from the audience? You might just see if you'd like, you can put them in the chat or you can just unmute and ask Rachel. If not, I mean, I guess there are so many more things more than I have or Rachel, because it's, it's never any fascination when we talk to her. But any more questions from the audience? As we... I, oh, Cindy, I've got please a question. Go <laughs> Sorry, I, I was late, Rachel. I was also trapped in a parallel universe. And but oh, I. No. Oh, um, thank you. Um, what I heard, I've already taken two pages of notes, so um, it was wonderful. Um, it was. It's mainly a comment um, rather than a than a question. And um, I, I caught what you had to say about um, the odd couple. And recently, I've just uh, finished writing um, a piece on Bartleby, who I think um, Bartleby and his employer are. A wonderful odd couple and um, what Rodney had to say about naming and it's mm. Bartleby who has the proper name um, but who is the who is this tragic comic um, uh, hero and it's his employer who we who we this is the only reason we know of Bartleby's existence who is only referred to as the employer and he's the protagonist and the narrator of Bartleby um, and who we who we will never really know anyway but um what uh, you had to say about um you know the figure of the living contradiction that one needs to um uh, I, I like how Jessica just put it this horrendous <laughs> this horrendous thing we call um existence that we have to live with and we can't escape from I, I love the way that 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 uh, Jessica just put that and one of the um, and how we try and uh, uh, short circuit the horrendousness of this by through laughter and and uh, comedy. Um, but one of the um, interesting things about Bartleby is that 
we don't know, but what we could presume is that um, he's really indifferent to his own contradiction. He gets to a point where he's completely, you know, either he uh, uh, completely uh, 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 it, it, it doesn't obfuscate contradiction but just dismisses it and becomes uh, neutralised by by contradiction and is indifferent to what uh, he might know or not know about himself. And I think that's uh, what we're left with is... Uh, his employer's contradiction. <laughs> you know, what oh, does Matthew B want? want? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Wow, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. So um I, I was really struck by um by the parallels that you were making with the odd couple to how we could read Melville's Bartleby. And I just wanted to 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 make that that comment and particularly how you were um, just before how you said the wonderful thing about um, modernism hasn't really, it's given us more questions rather than laying things to rest while we went into postmodernism. Well, actually, this is a this is a real problem. But thanks. Thanks, Rachel. We're not as indifferent as like we wish, as postmodern wishes we were. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we don't really know anything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, no, thank you for that comment. And oh, sorry. The direction that the book takes when it takes this more political turn later on is I start to think about how well tragedy what makes the tragic hero tragic is that they keep insisting on themselves the value of their current existence within a society that makes them a specific contradiction not just any contradiction but it, it they can only appear as a contradiction and what happens when oh my cat has joined us what happens when we really grasp ourselves by that contradiction instead of seeking a kind of visibility or representation that conceals that. Uh, what happens when we expose our crack? <laughs> I would say I kind of use this vulgar language sometimes, but, um, uh, and what if, we, what if we fail? What if we show, expose ourselves in our naked negativity? And maybe that looks like indifference or resignation or silence sometimes or not caring. And maybe that's a way to magnify the negativity that we are once we once we realize that society has turned us into a farce maybe from some people uh, from the beginning this is khan he has joined us <laughs> there's no stopping him <laughs> so I, I look at figures that uh there's a, a version of antigone that comes out of yugoslavia where antigone never turned never comes on the stage at all and there's a way that her absence is repeated and repeated and it magnifies, it's, it's very eerie, but I also see this as kind of a comic horror that she doesn't, she doesn't appear at all. And there's a kind of, I think that feminist resistance and that kind of failure to, maybe a failure to care, to laugh at it, but in a way that, yeah, I think nothing changes through that, through that process. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And maybe sort of building off of that, I could ask you to say something about this notion of critical laughter, which I don't know, might occur when someone exposes their own crack or someone else's crack and like these <laughs> yeah. resistance and the political turn you talk about your, your book uh, sort of taking in its uh, latter stages. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, this comes out when I turn to the young Hegelians and there's this, uh, there's a split in Hegel's, the first generation of Hegelians, where you have what I call it the defenders of the seriousness of religion, this kind of religious metaphysical reading of Hegel, and then the political writings, which um, I call them like they're making a comedy out of religion. And there's also a split within that sense of comedy of religion in that you have some of the young Hegelians and Marx's companions who are absolutely critical of the church and the relationship between the church and the state. And they think it should just be destroyed. And there's a kind of critical laughter there that's like wants to expose the contradictions of an institute that they don't belong to. So they think that the contradiction of this stage of history always belongs to a different institute or something that they're not a part of. In this sense, laughter gives us distance from the thing so we can make fun of it and its contradictions. But Arnold Ruga, who is a maybe the, a more one of the most Hegelians of the young Hegelians, he thinks that rather than say, exposing the contradictions within religion during their time period, that 
the church would have to come and feel that tension itself and kind of be an exhibitionist. So I use this idea of like the church as lifting its own skirt and showing its contradictions, like it, that it could be the site of actually social change if it could feel the way it had become distorted and corrupted by, by the state. So there's a kind of laughter that finds distance and always identifies contradiction as belonging to the object of laughter existing someplace else. And there's a different kind of critical laughter that comes when the site of contradiction exposes itself. So I like this idea of the exhibitionist exposing their crack, I guess. <laughs> There are uh, any other questions for Rachel? Oh, Ben's put that in the chat as well. Well, it might not be at the very moment that there are any questions. Um, Rachel, if that's okay, I was just going to pick up on the point that Jessica mentioned about Bergson and again the idea of dealing with, you know, being thrown into existence, like having to deal with being here, you know, like <laughs> this inescapability of being us, of being whatever it means, you know, to be human in particularly this day and age. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit, because I'm just really obsessed with the Laurel and Hardy thing, you know, and the doubling and the twinning. Um, but also what Jessica and Jessica kindly put one of her own publications in the chat so we can anyone who's interested can read up on that and Bergson, the theory of the comic. But Bergson also points to this idea of you know the mechanically crusted upon nature of um, you know of how to be human and perform it. And you were just saying that the church, if you could only get rid of this encrustedness, you know, and you could only get rid of the um this myth, you know, or this distortion of that, we've always been these like artificial things and critically laugh at that, and as Rodney was pointing out. So in your book, you mentioned the twice two formula. And I was wondering if that may be the way out that, you know, you, you and your book are you're pointing out. So could you maybe talk a bit about the twice two principle and, um, you know, how that might be a new formula, um, the way out for being this miserable human thing <laughs> that we are at, the, at this point? Unfortunately, I don't know if it's a way out of misery <laughs> or if um but it could be a, a structure of movement and and change and i guess we would have to hope that that's better but i i do think that that the that the contradiction within being surfaces in creative new ways and horrifying new ways in each stage but it's that uh it's also within our nature to want reconciliation to want um yeah to want social change and revolution and that's for hegel that's what propels change and movement within history is that that and that's why i say uh the, the book title is called the laughing matter of spirit and it's a of course it's a, a word play because the young hegelians were sometimes dismissive of this idea of spirit within hegel's work in the name of materiality if they wanted to be serious materialists that we had to Hegel's great, but we can stick to his idea of, of history, but do away with the idea of spirit. And for Hegel, spirit is that kind of, that desire within being itself or history itself for like, for movement, for change, and the desire to grasp itself for what it is, but it turns out that it can only grasp itself for what it is not, which is always it's it, these contradictions that constitute it. So I don't know if it's something we self-consciously do say like, we don't, I would say like we don't perform dialectic, but we can, but it's something that happens to us or a kind of rhythm. And I think there's different, different relationships to that tension between the splitting coming to the surface, the contradiction coming to the surface and our, our desire to overcome it. And yeah, I, I guess that's my answer to that is a really, hard and interesting question. Well, thanks so much and I think it opens up so many wonderful you know avenues for like thinking about this tension and the, the productive tension of this kind of humor and you know the laugh and spirit there which is I, I personally think it's fascinating. Um, any more questions from the audience? Are there 
any other questions that you'd like to ask or pop into the chat? Mm -hmm. Doesn't quite seem so. Um, in that case, might we just ask Jessica and maybe draw to a close then if there's another question and we thank Rachel so much for her time. But Jessica, might you say a quick word on the HSAN? And unfortunately we didn't get to that because you were trapped in the horror universe of um, the alternate Zoom room there. I'm dealing with your own twinning. Um, maybe you could say a bit about the HSN, why are we here and what is you know the bigger picture when it comes to the comedy um, comedy studies research framework that the HSN is relying upon to get people like Rachel to come here. Oh, Jessica, you're still on mute there. All, all of you, uh, the two organizers and, and Rachel par excellence, are people who cross disciplinary boundaries. You're not a typical philosopher. You're not a typical literary scholar, Rachel. Your work goes far deeper. You go into politics. You go into the nature of human existence. And, and the fact that you have turned to comedy, humor, and laughter is really magnificent. Thank you very much for doing it. Please keep pursuing. Please keep leading the way and showing us. But you emblemize the, the whole spirit of the human studies movement, which grew from very early beginnings, driven first by psychology and then by linguistics. And I went along to the very first conference, it's an awful long time ago now, 1976 in Wales, <clears throat> and sat through a most amazing array of papers and realized that no one had the full truth about humor and laughter. Laughter in a way is easier to study because it's a physical behavior. You can see the types of laughter, laughter's there or it's not there. There's unlaughter, of course, um, but, but it's a lot easier than humor, which has come to be the grab bag term for everything, of which comedy is now kind of a branch because it focuses upon the human characters that perform it, as opposed to the words that are written down, or the memes, or whatever. Um, so humor studies is what it's ended up calling itself, as it were, uh, simply because it's embracing all the disciplines. And I know that lower down on my screen are a wonderful array of names. Some of you I recognize, some of you don't, but I'm sure we would have as many disciplines as there are names, and then more beyond represented here today. Um, and that's the endless fascination of what we're doing, studying. And the Australasian Human Studies Network, starting with a base in Australia and New Zealand, trying to reach out to Asia and beyond, uh, that's what its mission is, is to encourage everyone to listen across boundaries and to think across boundaries and to collaborate across boundaries. And thank you for allowing us such a wonderful opportunity to do that today, Rachel. And uh, hopefully there will be more of it next week at our conference. Thank you. Brilliantly put. So give it up one more time for Rachel, please, and have an amazing, just fascinating talk. And thanks so much, Rachel, for joining us all the way from New York. Thanks to the audience for being with us. Thanks so much for attending. We will post the full recording online and when it's been edited and we've kind of gotten rid of these references to a trapped room thingy <laughs> to make it look nice and clean and, and edited. Um, Rodney, you've got the final last words before we end the recording. Over to you, then. Oh, I just wanted to echo uh, your thanks to everybody for being here. Thank you for the uh, contributions and questions. But most of all, thank you to Rachel for such a sort of generative, appropriately generative, you know, the double is generation, it would seem to me. And you not only showed us that, you know, double the pleasure, double the fun, but double is pleasure and double is fun. So uh, thank you again. And uh, yeah, let's all keep this uh, conversation and this critical discourse going. And if I may just also say thank you for having me here and I may love to join you in person someday in the future and I really sense that this is such an important network and a group of natural uh, friends and laughter and I really have enjoyed our conversation this conversation today and the little bit I got to talk to Ben and Rodney before this too and the questions that you both sent me were so fascinating too so 
I really hope this is the beginning of a relationship with this, this beautiful network. Of, and um, yeah, so thank you. Thanks so much, Rachel.